been talking to Mike Nola, and Mike will tell us who he is and, and why he's talking to us, and it's all Eric's related, obviously. Mike had a nickname back in the day. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, I was known as Noddy, Noddy Nola, yep. from Open Eye Studio. Open Eye Studio. Noddy recorded some of the bands at Eric's, and, um, well, let him, let's ask him to tell us all about it. Mike, welcome. Welcome, Peter. Right, well, let's start at the beginning. Go on. The very first time I went to Eric's was Easter Sunday in 1977. I've been touring with, uh, going to Eric's for a while, uh, probably six or eight weeks, but hadn't got around to it. And the Stranglers were playing, and it was a Sunday lunchtime um, concert or performance. And I remember just being blown away. Uh, and after that, my recollection is that I went to Eric's about two or three times a week yeah. to fit in with my other commitments. Because when I first went to Eric's, I was a DJ working for Radio Doom. Right. And um, I, I continued at Radio Doom until Easter 78, when I joined Open Eye. Right. I became a recording engineer, as you said, recording local bands. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's what I knew you. I, I knew you for that, because we have the, uh, we have the whole... Saga of the Lost Spitfire Boys tape, don't we? <laughs> we do. I recorded the Spitfire Boys on, I, it, I think it was New Year's Eve or thereabouts in 1977. It, was, it, it wasn't actually New Year's Eve, but it was close. Yeah. And we used the Radio Doom 4-track TIAC, and it was a great live performance. I remember trying to introduce the band, <laughs> and um, your lead singer was repeating everything that I... I was saying. He did, yeah. Funnily <laughs> enough, I can remember that now that you mention it, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, very foolishly, um, I, I forget who came to my flat, but, I, but Julian Cope was one of the people, and a member of the Spitfire Boys, and I parted with the tape, the four-track tape, on the basis that, that, that somebody wanted to, to make a four-track live EP. Yeah, I think, and then the tape... I think I was involved in that, possibly with Julian. Um, but I certainly don't know what happened to the tape, you know. Oh, it's a great shame because it was it was a good recording and it was a good set. It was. And the important thing about the Spitfire Boys for me <clears throat> is in 1977, the Spitfire Boys were the only truly punk band in Liverpool. You had bands like the Accelerators, but they were really pub rock. But you would say that the Spitfire Boys were a, pop, a punk band. Well, we started, I suppose, being inspired by the Sex Pistols. Um, so, yeah, um, any groups that were along before that, we did kind of dismiss as not being worthy of the punk label, do you know? No, I think you're absolutely right, Peter. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I mean, I'm delighted to have been part of that gig that you did at Eric's. You, you played through the Radio Doom sound system. And it was a great gig. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I think it was a four track that we were planning on doing, wasn't it? Didn't we have four songs for that? Yeah, four yeah. songs in mind. And um, I can't remember whether it was Paul Rutherford, but somebody from the band, along with Julian Cope, came to my flat in Southport. And very foolishly, I parted with the tape before I'd made a copy. No, it was <clears> me. <throat> it was me. Because I was working with. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I was working with Julian at the time. The only thing is, like, I certainly did not end up with that tape. Um, and we can only assume that it must be Julian. I, I don't know, you know. Now, another interesting story that I can tell you. Mm. I can't remember the guy's name, but he went on to be the drummer in Nightmares in Wax, Pete Burns' original band. Right. Um, and he was talking to Julian Cope, and it would be the summer of 1977. And uh, I arrived with a couple of my friends, and this guy turned around to Julian Cope and said, hey, the weekend punks are in. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that I have to confess is I am the same age now as Joe Strummer would have been had he not died. Oh, OK. So I'm a little bit older than people like yourself and Pete Wiley. Oh, and oh, oh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. How old is that, Mike? Come on. I'm 62. OK, you are older. <laughs> so, I'm the same. Joe Strummer was born in the same year as me. Right, right. Now, I have a conversation with Polly Styron from X-Ray Specs. Right. We interviewed her for a radio program we were going to do. And um, she was, um, I can't think of uh, 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 the right word to say, but let's use the word snotty. 
Mm. Because she felt that people like Joe Strummer were too old to call themselves punk. Oh, God. Yeah. Ageism. At, yeah. <laughs> at the time, she was 17. She worked in Woolworths in uh, wherever it was. She was the lead singer of X-Ray Specs. Of course. Yeah. I remember her well. And, um, yeah. Her attitude to, to people of Joe Strummer's generation was that he was too old to be a punk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, do you know, no, like, no. like, I'll be honest, like, I'll be totally straight with you. I'm actually 59. I'll be 60 this year. And for me, I, 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 understand, I understand what she's saying, but the actual underlying uh, message, if you like, was never about age. Some people. No, no, it was, yeah. an, it was an attitude and a style. Yeah, I, it was indeed, totally. Um, now, if you wanted to get political, you could do. If you wanted to get, uh, you know, campaign about something, you could do within the framework of the punk thing. But age was, I don't, I don't know, it, age was never a big thing for me. But I was a couple of years older than most of the people that I was hanging around with and knocking about with, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, I was born in 1951, and I know that Joe Strummer was also born in 1951. Right. But I would re regard Joe Strummer um, as a punk ambassador. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And... Um, but, you know, it has to be said that my introduction to the punk scene or punk rock music was because I listened to John Peel's show. You, and he uh, the, yeah, Peel that yeah. And that's how I got onto it. Another, and, another uh, old fart. <laughs> yeah, and it was through John Peel that I, I, I got to hear a lot of the new bands coming through. Um, many of them, as well as having their records played on its show, they didn't sessions at the BBC studio made avail. They did, of course. And, yeah. um, I don't know how I heard about Eric's. It's, it's an odd business. One of the first bands I went to see was um, The Jam. Um, but they didn't play at Eric's. They played at The Empire. Ah. And um, Paul Weller made some mention of, of Eric's. He said something like, next time we'll play at Eric's. Because he wasn't sincere. But at least he'd heard of Eric's. Yes, and you know, yeah. in, I know that the jam went on to be something else, but in the beginning, in the, the album in the city, it did have a, the jam. Although they were mods, they had a punk attitude. True and, enough. Um, true enough. I, I think. I, I think the overriding memory for me of that time is that it, it, there was a massive. It was like a tidal wave of enthusiasm, and um, a lot of things got caught up in that wave, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, the other thing I've not mentioned. As well as my involvement with Radio Doom and Open Eye, I was a part-time student at the Polytechnic in Preston. I was doing a high national diploma, HND, in electronics. At the same and time, got, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a part-time course. Wow. It was, it was um, a full day and an evening. Um, so you think, I think I do 9 till 6 on a Tuesday and then 6.30 till 9.30 on a Wednesday evening. Did the maths on a Wednesday. But I got myself into the Polytechnic as the DJ. So as well as working uh, with Radio Doom and Open Eye, on a Friday and Saturday, I was DJing at the Polytechnic in Preston. Wow. And playing a lot of that music. Um, it was difficult because a lot of the audience, the student audience in 77, 78, they wanted rock classics. Yeah. So... You know, The Who, um, Eric Clapton. But in the early period, 8 till 10, before most of the crowd had come in, while they were still in the bar, I would be playing a lot of that John Peel music, punk and reggae. And I did, was also responsible for booking some of the bands at the Polytechnic. And we had X-Ray Specs on, Susie and the, the Banshees. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of the... The Vibrators were a band we had on. Right. We had four, four or five of the well-known punk bands in 77 and 78. And I remember when we had the opening thing for the New Students' Union, Teardrop Explodes were the band we had on. Right. So basically, like, you embraced the whole uh, punk movement and the music and the music as it was at, the, at that time, yeah? Yeah, now, the other thing that I haven't mentioned is that in 1975, at a Radio Doom gig at the university, we met John Peel, and ah. he used our equipment. Huh. And then at the end of the evening, um, he said to us, if you're ever in London, get in touch and come along and sit in on a Radio 1 show. 
Okay. So later on in life, seventy-five, me and my girlfriend Karen did that, and the result was that um, in seventy. Seven, seventy-eight, seventy-nine. John Peel did some gigs for me at the Polytechnic. Great. Um, the deal was if Liverpool were playing at home and he was in the northwest, <laughs> he'd drive over. He wasn't prepared to do the whole night. You know, he wanted to do the last two hours, say ten till midnight. Uh, but on that basis, we got him. Let's let's say a competitive rate. Um, That's excellent stuff, yeah. Because I, I think I think we throw the word around legendary quite a lot, but we've talked about two legendary people there: Joe Strummer, definitely, and uh, John Peel. I mean, legendary, really. Absolutely. Know. Now the other thing is that in, in 1978 at Open Eye Studios, I did a session with Big in Japan. Oh, great! Okay. Um, even though they'd officially broken up. <laughs> And we recorded three songs, nothing special, Cindy and the Barbie Dolls, and an instrumental called Match of the Day. And in negotiation with Bill Drummond and, and the rest of the band, we did an EP called From Y to Z and Never Again. And the A side had the two songs that I'd recorded at Open Eye. And the B side were two songs that they'd recorded elsewhere. Uh -huh. And it was released as the first release on the Zoo label. Excellent, yeah. And Bill Drummond and I went down to Radio 1 to see John Peel to give him this record. <laughs> and um, it's funny because we were telling, we wanted him to play it there and then, and obviously he couldn't do that. But he did book Big in Japan to do a session for the show. So hang on a second. You and Bill Drummond went from Liverpool down to London to the BBC, knocked on the door and said, oh, can we see John Peel, please? Well, no, it was a bit more involved. All right, because, okay, okay, okay. Because I knew John Peel personally. Yeah, of course. And yeah. I, I had his home phone number. Okay, so he knew you were coming. Oh, but we had an appointment. Ah, so we, okay, we did, okay. We didn't just turn up on spec. He was expecting us. Okay, okay. But, that puts a different slant on things. But you know something? In the spirit of the day, if you had just turned up, it wouldn't have mattered, would it really? <laughs> no, I suppose not. But, I mean, it's one of those things I, you know, we had to wait outside. Yeah. And then John Peel came down and signed us in, and we sat in the back of the studio, and he was saying things like, well, I'm sure it's a great record, but, you know, I can't listen to it now. I'll, I'll take it home. But he did play it quite a bit, and we've sold 5,000 copies of that record. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and when you think back to that now, like, like you were clutching, presumably, a seven-inch vinyl single, right? Yes, well, it was an EP. An EP, it yeah. Tracks, yeah. Now, how do you think... How would you have done that today with, with the way things are today? Um, would you have even done that? Or would you have just... No, I mean, I mean obviously today, we, you'd have a website and people would download it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even have it on the CD. No, you wouldn't, would you? You know, yeah. But, you know, the way it works, I don't know if you listen to... Do you listen to BBC Radio 6 Music? Um, I'll be honest with you, no. Well, it's, it's um, a contemporary rock station it's on digital or uh, digital audio broadcasting yeah. so so you can basically get it anywhere in the world right well you get it on on, on the internet yeah. yeah but what they do they team up with independent producers and they have each day they'll have several tracks you can download for free so if i was releasing a track today a contemporary rock track then i'd approach the bbc and ask if they could download it or allow it to be downloaded as part of their programme for that day. Yeah. That's how you do it now. Um, you, you should, you should. I know you live in Ireland, but you know you can get Radio Six on the internet. It's really good. Oh no, I, I, I will give it a listen if I get a chance, because you know, as you probably know, I'm involved in quite a lot of things as well. Um, but yeah, but this, but it interests me another thing as well, and you might be able to talk about that. Is that um, like the record industry has completely changed? Like back in the day. Getting a record deal was the big thing. And you mentioned there, uh, like having your website and getting exposure seems to be the new way to go. Do you think that record companies were right to be worried that uh, these newfangled inventions are going to take their business away from them? Yeah, I mean, basically, what the, the, the record companies in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, made a lot of money out of doing not a lot. Yeah. Um, 
you know, records were overpriced, particularly CDs when they came out. You you think that in the late eighties, to buy a CD costs fifteen quid. Oh yeah, yeah. But well, you can buy a CD today for five or six quid. So the record companies, in my view, have got their comeuppance. Yeah, and I, mean, I, I tend I tend to agree with you there as well. Like like when cassette tapes came out, they said they were going to destroy music, and then when yeah, home home taping is killing music. Home taping is killing music. Yeah. And then um, CDs were going to kill music, and now the internet's going to kill music. And I see the exact opposite of that, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, but, but, but I suppose it has to be said that how the music scene differs is bands make most of their money, popular bands, by doing live appearances and touring. Which is kind of the way it should have always been, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you think that, see, if you look at the Beatles, when the Beatles... They stopped touring in, in the late 60s. Yeah. But they still made all their money because their records sold lots. But nowadays, you know, kids want their music for free. They want to be able to download it for nothing, um, to swap files with their friends for nothing. What do you mean, kids? I want my music for free. <laughs> well, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you think about how we treasured our music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, I, th I think it's been said, said before. Um, walk, oh, sorry, single. sorry, not, sorry. Uh, walking around with the album under your arm was like, oh yeah, was like a badge, you know. Absolutely. Um, I, I have no idea what kids do today. Uh, I certainly don't walk around with an album under my arm anymore. But what, but what, what do you say there? Because I cut you off. Well, no, I'm just saying that the way it is now, um, for young people. Let's not use the expression kids, but for younger people. Music is very throwaway. You know, they download it onto their iPod or their iPhone or their MP3 player. Um, it doesn't exist as a physical entity like an album, yeah. you know, an LP or a single or an EP. Um, and it doesn't have the same cachet. As you said, when you were when you were young and you'd walk around with the, your latest album you just bought yeah. on your arm so that people could see <laughs> who it was you, you were a fan of, whether, <laughs> whether it was Bowie or Zappa, whoever. Yeah. But it's not like that now. You know, music is very much a throwaway commodity. Yeah, how did you know I walked around with a Zappa album under my arm? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that because I was also a Zappa fan. All oh, right. And I met him in 1973 at the stadium. I never got to see Frank Zappa. Um, I would have loved to have done. I, I was actually, uh, I had a ticket bought for the one where he broke his leg and they cancelled the tour because some guy threw him off the stage for looking at his girlfriend. <laughs> right. Well, that was the gig in London at the Rainbow Theatre, but I saw him at the stadium. Oh, in Liverpool, in, yeah? Wow. Yeah, in September 1973, wow. and Roger Eagle was the promoter. Excellent. Excellent. And that, that's the first time I ever got to meet Roger Eagle. And he arranged for Radio Doom and the Blackie yeah. to do a video interview with Frank Zappa after the sound check. Fantastic. And did you do that, yeah? Well, yeah, we did it. Now, I've no idea what happened to the videotape, because the videotape was, was the possession of the Blackie, or the Great George's Project. Yeah. And it was done there using Sony um, Reel-to-reel -reel black and white video equipment. Wow. So, um, so, was there any archive of all of this stuff, or was it just basically? Well, I mean, what was the sort of like filing system, if there was one? Because it seems well, to me that we're talking about lost tapes all the time. Right. Well, <laughs> the, the 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 problem with the Blackies video is that they they wanted the equipment. Yeah. It's a time when you couldn't buy it in the UK. Ah, yeah. So they imported it from America. Right. And the result was that their equipment uh, used the American standard. That's um, 525 lines and 60 fields instead of 625 lines and 50 fields. So it meant that that videotape or those video recordings were not compatible with British television sets. Wow. So somebody now, might have just cleaned them out thinking they were rubbish or something. You know? Well, I don't know, because mm. in 1999, I was approached by the Blackie about rescuing these tapes yeah. and transferring them onto a digital standard. Yeah. But I said, I got um, a, a, an engineer from Brookside who was going to do it with me. But I said to them, the thing that I can't get is the black and white reel-to-reel -reel machine to put the tapes on. You'll have to do that bit. Okay. But I said I can provide studio-quality facilities to transfer and edit 
all of the Blackie's videotapes. But Bill Harper, the Blackie, never came across with his end of the deal, which was to source and locate um, an American standard reel-to-reel -reel black and white video machine. So it never happened. Oh. Um, I've no idea what happened to those tapes. I mean, 1990s is quite a long time ago. It is, of course, but they might still be there somewhere, you know. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I really hope that if anyone listens to this and that they've got any insight into where these missing tapes might be, because I mean, this is this is this is history. It's Liverpool. It's music. It, I, I think it's all important stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, there was there was. I mean, the American Soul Group, the Persuasions, uh -huh. uh, came to the Black, and we videoed them. Um, there was a video of James Brown made in um, in Manchester in 1973. Wow. There was, um, well, there was quite a lot of videos, and there's no reason why the tape should have been thrown away. But, you see, the, obviously nobody uses videotape anymore. Uh, they don't use cassettes, never mind reel-to-reel -reel video. At all, you know. But I suppose the, um, the film museum in Bradford might be able to, um, provide a, a machine to play the tapes back on. Yeah, well, well, I, I really hope that, that something comes of all this, that w we end up with a lot of networking going on and we can solve these little problems that um, we seem to have created for ourselves. You know, that, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's a great shame that the Blackie was so impatient. Yeah. They, they had to have video equipment um, and they imported from America before it was available here. Yeah, yeah. If only they'd waited for technology to catch up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, or perhaps when when the equipment came that was compatible with British television sets. Of course. They needed, yeah. to, re they needed to replace it. Yeah. So. But, uh, uh, we wandered away from Eric a little bit. What I can tell you is that some of the bands at Eric's were recorded by Open Eye um, on their video equipment. Yeah. So Open Eye had similar video equipment in 77 and 78 but it was british standard yeah and we did a, we did a video of big in japan for nothing special yes i think i might have seen that or even been in it yeah i'm not sure and uh, we, we did some video recordings at um at derek's including um oh do you know i can't remember who we recorded um uh, in during the block ends, we recorded. Right, but you know the fascinating thing is like like I always remember you like like you were always there in the background. Um, if, if it was sound, if it was recording, that was that was where you were. You were always doing that, and you seem to know what you're doing. And you know, I certainly didn't mind that you were obviously two years older or or whatever it was. You know, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and another thing, uh, Francesco was always around as well, taking photographs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He never said very much. He took all these photographs and, and didn't say much at all. But there he was taking photographs. He could talk when, when you got to know him and, and speak to him. But um, do you have any like abiding uh, recollection from that time period? Or Well, I went to a lot of gigs. Yeah. But I also got to DJ in Eric's. Um, I, I was a DJ as well as a recording engineer, uh -huh. but the difficulty that I faced is that is that Stormin Norman <laughs> was the resident DJ and there was no one seating him. No. Um, I might have that I'm, I'm good friends with Norman, but that's another story. But when Roger Eagle started to do the matinee shows yeah. so that under 18s could see the band early doors, Norman was working in probe and he couldn't be the DJ for the matinees. So I got to do it. Um, and one of my big memories is, is DJing and the cramps were on. Uh -huh. So I, I got to see the cramps at early doors in the matinee performance and see them again in the later evening. And the cramps, I thought, were fantastic. And can I ask you this? W was there a difference between the matinee performance for the youngsters and the later performance for the adults? No, it was more or less the same set. Wow. The same songs in the same order. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, on a Thursday, later on in 77, Radio Doom got to do some DJing in Eric's because we provided our sound equipment, our PA system, so that new bands could, could play at Eric's and have a, a PA system to sing through. Brilliant. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I also remember about Eric's 
was because Roger Eagle loved reggae, um, there were a lot of reggae, reggae acts played at Eric's. There was, yeah. So all of the, the better-known British reggae bands played, for example, Steel Pulse, um, who had the LP, Hands With Revolution, Matumbi, Reggae Regular, um, but also I saw Dillinger in Eric's in 1978, and um, I, I can't remember all of the other reggae stars, but reggae was a big part of Eric's, because that was Roger Eagle's main love at that time. Yeah. And, um, of course, as well as the punk thing, there were new bands coming through, like Elvis Costello and the Attractions, mm -hmm. Injury in the Blockheads, who you wouldn't say were really punk, but they seemed to be part of that movement. Yeah, a lot of bands got thrown into the, the pot, didn't they, really? And, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean... I can remember seeing Injury at, the, at, the, at Eric's interviewing afterwards. Um, saw Elvis Costello at Eric's. And I remember seeing bands like 999, Susie and the Banshees. Yeah. Um, the band that... Uh, uh, there was a thread on, on, on the group yesterday about the Pistols gig in 1976, but I wasn't there. There was. It was Roy who started that one, That's right, asking who was there... And he and was saying who, who he could remember was there, yeah. No, I, I, I said to him, I said, Roy, Eric's wasn't about the pistols, it was about the clash. Yes, I spotted that as well. And now then, that, yeah. and that's, that's actually a quote. Have you read the, um, the book that Bill Sykes wrote about Roger Eagle? No, I didn't yet. Well, you need to have it. It's called Sit Down and Listen to This by Bill Sykes. It's a biography of Roger Eagle. Excellent, I must read that. And it covers everything that Roger did from the early 60s at the Twisted Wheel until the late 90s at the International in Manchester. Brilliant. But the important thing is this, that um, people like Pete Wiley were interviewed for this book, Jane Casey, obviously. And Pete Wiley, there's a quote in the book, he says, you know, Eric's wasn't about the pistols, it was about the clash. And he mentions a particular date in May 1977 when I think the clash p first played at Eric's. And I was there. And for me... It was The Clash. I mean, I must have seen The Clash about a dozen times. And I would have loved to have seen The Pistols. I thought they were a great band. But the truth is, is in October 76, or whenever it was when they played at Eric's, I wasn't ready. I was aware of The Pistols, and I bought the record, Anarchy in the UK. Yeah. But I wasn't, I wasn't ready to embrace it. I wasn't sure at that point quite how I felt about it. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. I mean, in, in addition to being um, very enthusing kind of times, the, there was a, there was an element of, of scariness as well, you know, um, at least I felt. Um, I think I went to see the Pistols in Middlesbrough, of all places, and I know um, I think a few of us from Liverpool hired a van and went over there. Clive Langer would be one of the people that, that went, um, and I don't know why we did that. Uh, maybe they weren't playing in Liverpool or something. But I also saw The Clash in um, Eric's, and then I saw them in some other place as well. With, I went with a few more people from Liverpool, and I forget who was there. But, um, yeah, I, I seem to remember The Clash gig at Eric's. The walls were actually sweating. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I because I was in with Roger Eagle, I got to hear the sound check. Oh, cool. Okay. And, that, and, that, and the sound check was very different because it was all instrumental. And it was it was a lot of reggae. Yeah. And um, it was nothing. The sound check was nothing like what they did <laughs> in the evening time. Yeah. But I saw the the clash at the Apollo in Manchester twice. Yeah. Um, but going back to the Pistols, in the autumn of '77, I think it was September October. Might be wrong. They were touring as the Spots. Yeah, that and, might be the one that I saw them on. Yeah. And, Spots stands for Sex Pistols on Tour Secretly. Yeah. And I had them booked in, into a club in Preston Ooh. as part of the Polytechnic entertainment schedule. Uh -huh. But then the, the club owner got word of, or wind of the fact that <laughs> the Spots were actually the Sex Pistols and he pulled the gig. No way. <laughs> and you can imagine how gutted I was. Yeah, because they were banned from appearing. And, I know. And, and if, if they were due to appear in a town or a city or a borough, didn't the local councillors all have something to say? There were protests outside the town hall and all that kind of thing, you know? But, you know, 
this was all stage managed by Malcolm McLaren. Yeah, I, I heard that, yeah. And the, the ridiculous thing is the Sex Pistols, who are actually really a very good band, never got to play anywhere, or hardly got to play anywhere. And very few people got to actually see them. And Glenn Matlock gave up in despair and left. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you won't... I mean, I've... You, you, Roy White on the group yesterday was saying how tight they were. I mean, they were fucking brilliant, the Sex Pistols. They were a great live band, and it's such a shame that because of Malcolm McLaren, McLaren's stupidity, and he wanted to make them vilified and... Yeah, the rest he had a plan. Yeah. He had a plan which didn't include them playing gigs. Um, no, now, but it's interesting, and I'm I'm also thinking as well to the quote that you that you that you made there about Eric's not being about the Pistols, but about the Clash. Um, I I don't think you can simply say that it was about one band because for me it wasn't even about the bands; it was about the people that went. It was about you doing your stuff. It was about Fran, Fran Francesco taking his photographs. It was about. Ba- What was actually going on, rather than bands that came? They they were like a side no, show. I, I, well, I would agree, but it's just that for me, I, the, the Clash played at Eric several times. I can't be sure how many, and I went to all of the shows. But I, I mean, I suppose when I say Eric's was about the Clash, not the Pistols, it's it's true what Roy White said. Well, that's because you didn't go to see the Pistols. <laughs> 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 I don't... Now another another memory I must just bring in. Oh, do is that when I read the book, uh, the Roger Eagle book, there's a description of the police raid that closed Eric's. Oh, okay. And the band that were playing was the Psychedelic Furs. Right. And I'd completely forgotten about this. And I'm reading the description of how the police came in. Okay, and when, with... and when was this exactly? Do you, rem- do you remember the, um, the, the year and the... I think it was, I think it was 1980, but... And I can, if we want, I could get the book out and give you an exact date. Oh, no, it's okay. I mean, pe- people have got the internet these days. We can find out anything, you know, so... But the police came in and they were sort of, for want of a better put, way of putting it, pumped up with, with neckties on. <sighs> and, and But they were violent. And they were pushing people over and dragging people up the stairs, girls by the hair. It wasn't good. What was the pretext for that then? I mean... Well, if, if, when you read the book... Um, Pete Forwell says that he thinks that the police came to do an inspection, the licensing police, and they wanted to have a drink. And they went down, but they couldn't drink alcohol because they were on duty. But Peter thinks, with the benefit of hindsight, that they were expecting a bribe. Ah. And when the bribe wasn't forthcoming, they mounted a raid. So we're talking about, you know, Corruption of, of um, well, a very bad level of corruption, because there wasn't any reason to to raid Eric's. It it wasn't um, there were no drugs, or very little in the way of drugs, because Roger Eagle went round and threw anybody out who was smoking cannabis. Sure. And cocaine and other drugs such as speed were not part of the punk scene. It's interesting, um, and, we, and we have to say that, that this is just us talking right now, and, and we're not pointing fingers at anybody. Um, these are just simply allegations, yes? Well, the, I'm, I'm just repeating what I read in the book. Of course, Peter, yeah. Well, it's an Peter interesting Fulwell, take, though, definitely. Peter Fulwell thinks that the raid occurred because they didn't bribe the licensing police. Yeah, because like Eric's, Eric's have been there for years, and there was never any problems, any trouble. If if there was, it was just minor, you know. Yeah, I mean there were no, there were never fights. It wasn't full of people who were underage. The only thing you could genuinely say that was was awry were there were definitely times when it was overcrowded. Yeah, but that made it. <laughs> oh, of course it did. So, anyway, the, the police came in, the psychedelic furs were on. And I remember, do you remember the, the, the entrance where the, the, the stairs where the band brought their equipment down? Of course, yeah. So I, that, the, I just pushed the fire doors open and ran up the stairs and out and I was gone. Right. Because the police were being violent and there was no need for it. And can you tell us how many, how many police would there be? Can you, can you remember? Maybe a hundred. Quite a lot. No way. And 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 were they uniformed or what? Yeah, some uniforms, some plain clothes. And they just what what did they do? They they just like went in and started like dragging people out and hitting. Yeah, them? and they they told the band to stop playing and the lights went on. 
So they were and all that... they were all obviously pumped up for for some reason, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it was a raid, and it closed the club. The close the club closed. Right. You'd have to ask. Um, can you first of all, can you actually do that? You know, when when, when something is legal. I mean, um, with regard to bribes, I don't even want to make any comment. But to run any kind of a club, you do have to, like, um, have licenses and so on. And then there are inspectors that do say, oh, you need to improve the toilets or you need to do this and that and the other. And then you do it and everything's fine. A raid is, is like a last resort, isn't it, really? Well, it is. Now, I've been involved in, in the club in 1972, I think it was. And it was a raid. Wow. And it was a club called The Pun which was um, in the Duke Street area. I can't remember what street it was actually on. And it was a black club. Right. And I was there on, I think it was a Thursday night with my wife, at the time when I was working for Radio Doom. But at, on a Saturday, I was one of the DJs. Yeah. And it was, it was a, you know, it was a soul and funk club frequented by black people. Because at that time in Liverpool, there was an unofficial colour bar and if you're a couple of black lads and you wanted to go to the top rank or the equivalent, you could just be knocked back. You know, there was, as I say, it was an unofficial colour bar in, in nightclubs. So black people mm. had to have their own club. Is it like that and today? I, I've, I've not been in Liverpool for no, years. No, no, it's not like that today. But I was in this black club um, and the police arrived and did a raid and they were being violent to both men and women indiscriminately why the, no, why the hell do they do that i just don't get it you know because the, the police force at that time was institutionally racist mm, and they raided that club for no other reason that it was a black club frequented by black people and they said to me if i was you sir i wouldn't come to a club like this <laughs> and i said well actually i'm the resident dj on a saturday and that shut them up um but i was a member but my colleague from Radio Doom called Dave Kay, he wasn't a member, uh -huh. and he was prosecuted for being in a, in a member's club while not in possession of a membership. By the authorities? By, by the... Yeah, he had to go to court. Now, <laughs> the, the police did that because they wanted to close it down. So they were saying they, their basic argument was that the club... Because at that time, if you wanted to drink after hours, you had to be a member of a club, and you had to have a a little card that said you were a member of Eric's or a member of the pun or a member of the timepiece. And um, my friend was prosecuted. I don't know what the um, the fine was, but I, I'm the type of guy who always was a member. I was a member at Eric's, you know, as a member of Wigan Casino, as a member at the pun club. Yeah. But it was a frightening thing to see the police come in and just rough everybody up. And they did the same at Eric's. And it's in the book. It's... It's in the Roger Eagle book. I, 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 can't, I can't recommend the Roger Eagle book enough to you. No. I'm, I'm, you're breaking up a little bit, Peter. Uh, hang on a minute. Um, yeah, got you now. Yeah, yeah. I appear to be back again. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll just ignore that. That never happened. You, but what fascinates me is like looking at it. Like, there's, there's all like, who's pulling the strings of the police when, when they raid these clubs? And is it as simple as, well, they didn't pay the, uh, you know, the brown envelope didn't get passed along? Is it as 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 sick and corrupt as that? Because no, I think I don't think it is. Right. I think the truth is that. Um... The police in Liverpool in, in the 70s, as well as being racist, they had, a, if you like, a Boy Scout attitude. And they would see punk rock and punk rockers as antisocial and undesirable. A threat to society. Yeah. So I think that, um, I think maybe Peter Ford was right when he said we didn't bribe the licensing inspectors, so they mounted a raid. But I think there was also an underlying feeling amongst um, higher officers in the police force that a punk rock club in Liverpool was undesirable. We don't want it. Yeah, that's interesting, though. But, but those people, like judges and senior officers, are completely out of touch with the rest of society, as, as we know, you know. Uh, I mean, the fact is that, I mean, Eric's have been there all of 77. Yep. All of 78, all of 79, and suddenly, and I can't remember what month it was, in the middle of 1980, they mounted a raid and it was gone. 
Wow. Now, I don't know if you remember, it reopened as Brady's. Well, I, I had left Liverpool by that time. So what, what, what year did you leave Liverpool? Uh, probably just prior to all this happening, probably late 79 or early 79. I really can't remember, to be honest. Um, yeah. if, if I sat down and worked it out, I probably could. But I was certainly gone when this happened. But I, but I think I did hear about it because I did stay in touch with some people for a while, you know. Yeah. Um, but it... Even even looking back at that, it doesn't make any sense, does it? You know, like you say, Eric's was there. I think Eric's was starting in '76. Actually, I think the Pistols gig was in '76. Yeah, but it wasn't in the basement, was it? It was. It was in the club that. Well, I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> it's not, it, yeah, it wasn't in. It wasn't in the club that we know as Eric's. It was called Eric's. Yeah. But it was actually upstairs. It was the club that went on to Victoria Street, I think. Right. It's now called the Revolution. Now, the other thing that I would mention is that a couple of years ago, Eric's reopened. Yes, it did. I saw that. Yeah. And I've gigged there as a DJ. Okay. And um, I've seen bands there, including the Magic Band, Captain Beefheart's old band. Uh, I saw I saw them myself in Dublin last year, and I must say that was one of the best concerts I was ever at. <laughs> no, there, it was a great concert, and Drummer did a great job. Totally, yeah. John French on vocals. But uh, I mean, Eric's how uh, how Eric's differs from um, how it was in our day. The bar is now in the main room, not to the side, which actually makes the main room a bit smaller. Ah, okay. But it's but it's posh. You know what I mean? It's it's decorated and it's clean and a, a beautiful floor and a, a nice stage and lights. You know, it's it's a high tech club. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> well, I suppose I know it doesn't sound right, but in you know, in the two thousands. <clears throat> um, people wouldn't want to go to a club. Um, the, the way is there was the way Eric's was at the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, okay, we're not dumb enough to think that nothing, you know, nothing changes. Things do improve and things progress. And and like, um, I certainly didn't um, kick off this Facebook page with the idea that we were just going to live in the past continuously because I I totally believe in in like progress and that. But there's a lot of opposition to the new Eric's, isn't there? Are you aware of that? Oh, yes, I'm aware of that. People like Jane Casey don't think it should have reopened. Right. But, you know, I suppose, I mean, they've made a decision, the people that own it, to use the same name um, and not call it something different. And logo so as well. The same logo, although that logo, it, well, that wasn't Roger Regals' logo. That logo belonged to Eric's the Taylors in in the early seventies. Are you serious? Because I often wonder where that came from. Oh yeah, it was it was. Um, if you were a mod in in the late sixties and early seventies, you you got your fashion uh, wear, your, your your parallel trousers and so on from a tailor's called Eric's in Liverpool, and the logo for the club is exactly the same as the logo for Eric's. Okay, the this is amazing because we were talking about the Jew Shop on London Road yesterday. Um, where was Eric's shop then? There was there one of the, there, there were two shops and one of them was was by the tunnel entrance. But I I can find out. I, I, a friend of mine's got a photograph of it. Um, it was it was it was near the tunnel. Um, and the logo over the door was exactly the same as the logo that Roger Eagles and Pete Fulwell used. Yes. So they just they obviously borrowed that. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously they 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 called it Eric's. Because they wanted a name that was nothing like, you know, um, I don't know what 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 did clubs get called in those days? Um, I don't know. There was um, twisted. You no, know, Cinderellas or. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those um, like your average nightclub. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they had all kinds of crazy names, didn't they? I mean, in Liverpool, there was the Babaloo and there was Uglies um, <laughs> in the seventies. Yeah. And. Um, the Bodega. But, yeah, but you know, all I can say is, is um, get hold of the book. No, I will. I, I, I definitely will have to do that. Um, later on, I'll dig the book out and I'll, I'll send you a private message on Facebook with the title of the book, the author and the publisher. I'll be able to find it online in about two minutes, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, listen, but, well, Mike. I think we've covered a lot of ground there. So, uh, and again, we, we've hit the 45-minute mark. There's no rule that says how long these things should be, 
But I often think about people listening to them, and it, they might want to go and make tea or something. Yeah, well, know? that's right. I mean, I hope, I hope, um, you know, that, that, that this has been useful to people. Well, me too. It's been great. It's been great to um, to reminisce yeah. about the Eric Day. And I definitely want to do a part two and a part three and all the rest of it. If you know, if if you're up for that, and uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, because there's a lot of things that we haven't even gone near. You know. No, and I need to read the book and remind myself about some of the actual nights that I went to. Yeah. Because in the, the Roger Eagle biography, there's a full list of all the Eric States. Really? The name wow. of the band and, and um, the, the date that the band performed. That would be absolutely priceless, wouldn't it, to have a copy yeah. of that? Yeah. But the last thing that I'll, I'll mention before I sign off is the first time I went to Eric's of an evening, because I told you that... I went over Sunday lunchtime to see the Stranglers. Yeah. I walked in, and Big in Japan, who had been the support act, were just finishing off. And they were doing the song Big in Japan. And Jane Casey had a shaved head, and she was screeching into the microphone, Big in Japan. Yep. And that's an abiding memory. Of course, Jane Casey has been a friend of mine since then. And when Radio Doom do the, uh, not Radio, when we do our Quadrant Park reunions, we do them at the Picket. Um, and Jane Casey's in charge there. They call it District now for some reason. But okay. It's, basically, it's, it's, a, it's a live music venue in Liverpool 8. And the, there's um, something big planned for this year, I hear, as well, yeah? Yeah, we've got a Quadrant Park reunion on the 12th of April. 12th of April. I'll I'll yeah. do what I can to be there. I, I'm I'm um I'm tied up at the very beginning of May, so it's a slim chance. And I think as well, I think another coup for Liverpool is is getting uh, John Cale to come along and 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 do that thing that he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I, I did I see John Cale at Eric's? I'm pretty sure I saw John Cale at Eric's. Um, I, I certainly saw them um, afterwards in the Feathers Hotel. <laughs> one of my problems in 77 and 78 was that I, I was a jobbing DJ yeah. so I didn't get to see all of the bands because um, you know if I was DJing then it just wasn't going to happen no I know I, I was fortunate enough that I had no other commitments all I had to do was like be there and um, I was there as often as possible and I have to say uh, I have nothing but like happy memories of that entire period um it was just it was a wonderful time to be around it really was and um you know thanks mike for that all right yeah it's great to talk to you we'll get thanks again we'll get to the part two at some point okay right. bye for now cheers <laughs> Yeah.